Oh. Hola señoras y señores, yo soy Alina C y estoy en Varadero, Cuba. Ok, folks, I'm in Varadero, Cuba, uh, at the beach, fairly windy conditions, and I guess it's time for another tutorial right here from nature. And uh, what I wanted to do today for the tutorial is to do one more clinical case of the endosync in my everlasting quest here to figure out the proper settings for the endo sequence and the ESX instrumentation and obturation system. I've been playing around with some of the uh, settings and I wanted to showcase another case uh, being done here with the uh, endosync and endosync AI uh, with ESX instrumentation and obturation system. Obviously because of the wind and the crazy conditions out here on the beach, we're going to go inside where I can talk about the case and uh, you know the way I managed this particular uh, uh, tooth for root canal therapy with the ESX instrumentation and obturation system. Okay folks, we're back inside in the safety of our hotel room and away from the wind tunnel that is the Veradero Beach. So I have a case for you in the, um, it's a maxillary first premolar, uh, the maxillary right first premolar. And as you can see here on this radiograph, this tooth has a fairly large uh, restoration on the mesial that has caused irreversible pulpitis. And as you can see on this angle radiograph, you have two roots in this tooth, as is the case in almost all maxillary first premolars that you have two roots and as usual we always start by taking a look at a root anatomy and also make an estimated working length of the roots and here it looks like it's going to be 24 millimeters. So we proceed to take the uh, the, the, the saber cut burr from our Rewald Endo access kit and create our outline form. Now the saber cut is a very efficient uh, burr and as you can see it using the Forza electric handpiece here, uh, it, it cuts like butter basically. And the first goal, and anytime you're treating a, a tooth that has reverse pulpitis, is to nick the pulp. And although you always test the tooth and make sure the tooth is uh, already numb before you start, you always want to give an intrapulpal uh, at the pulp horn in these ca cases. Now, the patient never feels the intrapulpal here, but what the intrapulpal does is it, is it acts as assurance for your uh, procedure for the rest of the procedure, basically. And the goal is the patient should not feel the intrapulpal but you have to have an intact roof of the pulp chamber for the intrapulpal to work. So uh, after the outline form is created, I'm using my uh, Forza V3 ultrasonic, piezoelectric ultrasonic with a E14 D tip, which is a diamond coated ultrasonic uh, tip, which, and the goal here is to just kind of make everything blend in together from the roof of the pulp chamber to the walls into the orifices. But for more efficiency, sometimes you may want to use a 6856 Duracut burr, which is a, you know, which is a rotary burr that is diamond coated. Uh, with the Duracut technology and it's very efficient and uh, uh, can cut aggressively and create that shape that you want and then use the Forza V3 diamond coated tip to make sure everything is blending in. The goal of your access preparation is to have straight line access to the mid root portion of the tooth and uh, creating a straight line access at this point is really essential. And you can see here, you can see both the buccal and the lingual canal after this access preparation, which means that the primary part of the access is done. And now it's time to create our secondary seal and get better isolation because the primary seal is your rubber dam that just prevents the tongue and uh, the you know, gross saliva from getting into the field. But I don't do my secondary seal until a little bit later on where everything is settled. I have my access and now I can seal in the cravicular fluid seepage that usually occurs around the rubber dam clamp and around the tooth. And uh, this is just the caulking material that, that does that 
and now I'm ready to begin the uh, treat uh, the treatment and the uh, rotary instrumentation. I'm using the expediter, which is the first file we would use. Now, ideally, you should use a hand file here at this point. First, use a size eight or a ten or something that would actually give you um, uh, some kind of a. Uh, uh, you know, val uh, validation of the patent canal that you have. But, you know, I, I kind of have a little bit more experience, so I proceed to go ahead straight with the expediter. And I'm using the rhythm motion here, which is three, stro uh, three strokes, basically, followed by removing the file and wiping it. Now, I'm using the EndoSync and the EndoSync AI, and I'm using OTR motion. And the OTR setting in this case has been set to 0 0.2, which is fairly low. And if, for those of you who recall, OTR motion is basically taking the file to a given torque setting, and if it reaches that, then it'll go to a 90 degree counterclockwise before it rotates forward again. So I do that three strokes or so in uh, with the expediter in the buccal and the lingual canals each side. Here are just way too many strokes. So yeah, I think that was like five. Uh, you really don't want to do that. You should really try to stick to three just as a measure um, of, uh, of safety. Of course, every time I do a couple of rhythm motion strokes, I proceed to use the ultrasonic and water. And what this does is it removes any loose debris that's in the canal. And uh, then uh, we add some hypochlorite to it that could turn the water into to, to, uh, bleach again. So right now, though, we're drying the top part of the tooth so that I can use my 1502 to measure the working length. The EndoSync AI has been connected, and I'm using 3Motion, and there we go. Right on the buckle, the file went, proceeded to go down, and then it stopped. And when it stops, it means that it basically has reached the apex. So I reconfirm by pulling it back out again, and then going down, and every time, if it stops at the same position a few times, then it means that that is actually the apex. That's fairly accurate reading. The key with the apex locators is to make sure you don't have any short circuits. So on the buckle, we have that, and I measured that it turns out to be 24 millimeters. Now on the lingual, however, it feels like I'm hitting a little bit of an obstruction at about 23 millimeters. So what that means is it's time to do some hand instrumentation. Instead of pushing my uh, rotary file, I stop and use a little hand instrumentation with a pre-curved and a hook number 10 hand file to create space, which I will then, once I gain that space, I then proceed to use my Scout 1502. And as you can see, now the Scout 1502 follows that hand file easily and enlarges the canal to a 15 very quickly. Now, I take the 1502 uh, and get my working length there. On the buckle, I, it was fairly large canal and I, my expediter actually already fit to the, uh, to the full working length. So I'm now proceeding to use the um, expediter here uh, on the buckle and the 1502 on the lingual and I take a confirmation radiograph that shows that both expediter and the um, 1502 Scout have reached full length on the buckle as well as the lingual canal uh, and we're basically ready right now for instrumentation. Okay folks, I just want to do a quick cut here to remind you, I'm back from Cuba, this is me from the future, and just wanted to insert this little piece of video in here to remind you that I, you will see me use the EndoSync and EndoSync AI with these rotary uh, files, including the uh, Scout uh, 1502, and minimize the use of hand files during my instrumentation. But I want to uh, be very adamant in explaining to you that the use of hand files during the donic therapy is really critical and important. Uh, you know, once you have done 22,000 cases like I have done, I'm sure you will find in situations in which you will be able to get away without using hand files, as you will see here during my use of the endosync. Uh, but I just want to be clear that using hand files and using stainless steel files ahead of your rotary files will increase the safety of your procedures. With more experience, you will know when to cut um, corners and be able to use uh, just the rotary files to measure the working length and then really minimize the use of hand files. But we're still not at a point where universally we can put the hand files away and uh, you know just use rotary files. I just want to be clear about that. I don't want to miscommunicate and uh, create a situation where everybody thinks that you know the, there's no longer any need for the use of hand files. Anyway, let's get back to the procedure. Sorry for the interruption.
Now that we know that the 1505, uh, 1502 has reached the apex on the lingual, now it's time to get the 1505 to go down to the end on the lingual canal as well. So we do that and now we have both the buccal and the lingual uh, prepared with the expediter all the way down to the full uh, working length. Now we choose a size 3504 as the uh, finishing file for both cases and now the goal is to get the 3504 down to the apex in each canal using the rhythm motion followed by um, wiping. Now you can see that each time that I'm taking the file into a stroke it's engaging the OTR which means that it almost turns into almost a reciprocation type of a motion. Which is why, in a case like this, frankly, I think that I set the OTR uh, of 0.2 a little bit too low for a case like this. I could have probably raised it up to a 0.6, and I would have been a lot more efficient in my cutting. But I had the OTR set at 0.2, and, and when you set the OTR at a lower level, then you're increasing your safety. When you're setting it at a higher level, you're actually increasing your efficiency. So it just means that by sending it at a point two, that it's going to take you more um, uh, kind of strokes until you reach the apex. But it's very important that after every three or four rhythm motion strokes that you actually uh, stop and use an ultrasonic or something to remove the loose debris that's in the canal. So as usual, as I mentioned, after every few strokes we remove the um, file and then proceed to place some hypochlorite in the canal and then do more of this uh, rhythm motion. So you can see three strokes and you can see every time the file is reaching uh, closer to the reference point and we already are at the full working length on the buccal canal. And now that we've reached the full working length in the buccal canal after a number of strokes of rhythm motion, it's time to go on the paddle canal and do the exact same thing. You can see that you know we're about four or five millimeters from the apex and by taking these little tiny rhythm motion strokes, each time the file is grabbing a little bit of dentin and you're moving your way down the canal. Um, at any points like this, if you find that you are having a lot of resistance on the way down, just make sure that you take the expediter down to make sure that you have the, the, the canal still patent, and then you may have to to go to one size smaller file too. But here we're going to continue with the 3504 with the goal of getting the 3504 down to the full working length. So again we're just going to continue with the same idea of uh, rhythm motion which is three strokes to engagement um, with an OTR setting of 0.2. And, uh, as you can see that each time that each stroke is almost engaging the OTR because the setting is so low. Stroke after stroke we're working our way down. Uh, as I mentioned before having the OTR setting that low increases your safety but it will decrease your efficiency. So it's a kind of a decision for you to make as to what is the priority here. Finally here I think in this uh, one more kind of a uh, couple of different Passes, passes of the rhythm motion will probably get us all the way down to the full working length on this paddle or root two. And wipe one more time. And uh, I think right now then we're going to get all the way down and here we go. One, two, and here on the third stroke you can see we've reached on the lingual canal also we've reached the full apex. So we have 24 millimeters uh, prepared with a size 3504 ESX file both on the buccal and on the lingual side. And now it's time to do the final disinfection and I'm using a negative pressure uh, technique by putting the vacuum at the apex of the tooth and adding the hypochlorite on top. You may prefer to use a positive pressure system, just make sure you stay passive, you're having a side vented needle and that you are not letting the needle get locked in there. And now it's the keys to try to irrigate with a large volume of irrigant. I use full string hypochlorite because of the fact that I use negative pressure, but if you are using positive pressure then you may want to have a diluted form of hypochlorite to increase your safety. Remember the most important thing is always to be safe. Now I proceed to cone fit and I use uh, and I prefer to cone fit one size smaller BC cones here because as you saw it took a number of strokes for the uh, for the finishing file to get down which means that it was a fairly tight canal for that shape. So by having one size smaller cone fitted to that 
final finishing file, I allow room for the escape of the BC sealer that you can see me inject now with the advanced technique directly into the canal uh, so that this, the cones can seat all the way down. Now I'm using my expediter here, or you could use a 1504 in a reverse uh, speed at like about 100 RPM. And what that does is almost like a lentulo, it coats the canal walls. And I quote the, uh, the fitted cones and I make sure that they're seated all the way down in each buckle and now the lingual canal. Okay, sorry again for the interruption, but I want to emphasize another safety point here, and it's direct injection into the tooth should only be done by those people who have a microscope with light who can see what is going on. And I'm not talking about having loops, but literally a microscope and uh, at high magnification of lights, because I've seen so many people sending me x-rays where they have overfilled uh, the root because of the fact that they're not seeing what they're doing and they're injecting directly into the tooth. Again, for the sake of safety, I want to emphasize this point that if you don't have a scope, you should uh, inject into a paper pad and then put the uh, sealer into the canal, traditionally like any other technique, by uh, just coating and lubricating your file and placing it in. Now, one little other trick would be that you can inject into the chamber of the tooth and then take the sealer down with your file, but never try to inject anywhere beyond the coronal one-third of the root the key here is to make sure that the locking pliers that you use are locked at the reference point after you fit the cones and then you leave them locked like that so that this time when you're cementing it, you can make sure that they're seated. Take a radiograph to confirm that everything is looking good and now it's time to use your cordless heat source here is the Endo Pro 270 and in order to uh, quickly remove the handles of the scutta percha, first at the cable surface area of the axis, and then slowly remove more and more until you reach the orifice of the canals. Once you reach the orifice of the canals, the molten gutta percha can then be condensed with the largest plugger that you have, which would be a size 10, followed by a size 9, with the main idea of taking the molten gutta percha and cover the full surface of the um, of the canal orifice. And what that does is it acts almost as a lid or as a barrier for the onset sealer uh, below it so that once you go to the next step and use the ultrasonic to clean the chamber, you're not washing out the sealer from inside the root canal. By taking the molten gutta percha and spreading it, you're covering the sealer um, apical to the orifice. And as you can see here, I'm using the same um, Forza V3 ultrasonic with the uh, E14 D tip, and just after 10 seconds or so of uh, walking it around the chamber, not trying to touch the gutta percha, do not touch the gutta percha with the ultrasonic. Your goal is to only touch the dentin on the walls by moving the, um, uh, the tip of the ultrasonic circumferentially against the walls of the axis preparation here. And uh, you can see that that cleans the, all of the onset sealer very effectively because it's hydrophilic from inside the root canal. And now you can dry up the, uh, the, the water. And I also then proceed to use a size 9 condenser at the very end after the ultrasonic and drying so that I can then just condense the margins of the gutta percha right where it meets the tooth. So I walk the number 9 condenser 360 degrees circumferentially along the margins of the gutta percha and dentin. And what this does is it helps um, close the gaps where potentially some sealer may have uh, washed out with the use of the ultrasonic. And it just kind of closes up that gap by kind of compressing it. Once this part is done, now the, uh, the root canal is complete and it's time now to um, place either a final restoration, if you're the restorative dentist yourself and you're uh, going to restore and put the core in there right away, you could do that. Um, in my case, I'm practicing in an area where the restorative dentist would like to place the uh, core buildup themselves. So I basically place a cotton and cavit and send the patient back to see their dentist uh, within a month to place the um, the restoration up on top. Now, you, you could place a bonded restoration right away. You could place a Fuji uh, or glass based restoration. 
uh, I tell patients that the tooth will be sore for a couple of weeks and then it will return back to normal. Uh, one month following the uh, root canal therapy, the tooth should be back to normal and it should have absolutely no symptoms. If they have any symptoms, it's not normal and at that point has to be evaluated for what the cause is. But if you've done proper endodontic therapy, you've achieved the length, you've found all the canals, you've done good irrigation and disinfection and prepared a large epical size preparation, vast majority of patients have no problems. And here it is, the final post-op radiograph showing in a straight direction that uh, we have reached the full working length and everything is looking good in terms of the taper. And here is the same tooth again with an angled uh, radiograph showing that we have large enough adequately prepared apical preparation, a reasonable taper, and a very good fill. And now the core buildup is going to be done next, uh, as well as any potential um, additional cuspal coverage restoration that may ensue. So I hope this uh, case was uh, able to show you how a premolar tooth can be instrumented uh, efficiently and effectively using only a couple of files uh, with the ESX instrumentation and efficiently obturated using bioceramics. Of course, the key here is to understand that there is a place for hand files and that is to scout and find uh, the canal before your rotary files can enlarge it very quickly. I will have future tutorials on the user hand files and why they're still not a lost art and it's very important to use them. Okay, so this is basically the, the, the case I wanted to talk to you about. I will do more tutorials to uh, demonstrate the use of the endosync and the OTR motion with different type of uh, settings, whether it's 0.2 or 0.6 um, and uh, the kinds of uh, cases that you will get and the difference that it makes with the different settings. Because it's a really critical thing to understand as to how you can maximize uh, the safety as well as the efficiency of OTR uh, when it comes to clinical uh, implementation of the EndoSync and EndoSync AI with the ESX instrumentation and obturation system. For Reworld Endo from the Veradero Beach in uh, Cuba, this was Ali Nese and I hope you found this information helpful. Mm -hmm.